1955 mid-engine cars and then finally a sports racing class for cars up to 1964. And as you can see it covers a whole range of different cars including some glorious ones. This car one is a beautiful looking thing isn't it Colin? Yes, that's Paul Loisch's car, and uh, actually this is a very famous car. It's a listed Jaguar of 1958. It uh, did very well in that year racing, and uh, it was dismantled, unfortunately, after a major accident, and uh, was cobbled up with another car, but subsequently uh, it was rebuilt back into its original form, and uh, it's, uh, it's great to see this motor car back on the circuit again. The sort of car driven by the great Archie Scott Brown? Yes, a very similar car, and uh, of course we saw that car at uh, Ardmore in the grand days of motor racing here in New Zealand. Archie Scott Brown, an amazing driver, very fast, drove that big powerful machine. He was almost a one-armed driver, had a crippled arm and uh, drove under an awful handicap. Was eventually killed in motor racing, wasn't he? Yes, a very sad day, although of course he could still drive better with one arm than most of us could with two. Right, now on the front row, the little tiny one, car 40 down there, is uh, a very famous driver, David Silcott from Christchurch, in the little Cooper Vincent, a car, a, a only twin-cylinder motorcycle engine, mostly of 1,100 cc's. Yes, da David's very well known in motor racing here in New Zealand. He's uh, raced everything from Jaguar Mark IIs, which he prepared and built himself, down to today and when he's uh, racing this gorgeous little machine. He also prepares and races uh, historic and classic motorcycles, so Dave really has only just put on an extra pair of wheels for today. Grand fellow and a magnificent little motor car. And alongside him, let's just have a look who we've got over there, a very different sort of motor car and a most beautiful shape, what many people would regard as a tradi traditional sort of motor car. That's Alan de Cadene, the British driver, in a Connell B-Type. Now, Alan's run in or Alain has run in uh, Le Mans events and so on. That is a glorious looking machine. It's a fabulous little machine, very similar to the uh, 250F uh, Maseratis, and of course it raced against them in its heyday. This actual car raced at Syracuse and won the, the uh, Grand Prix there in 1955. So it's a very, very famous motor car, incredibly valuable. Oh, with Tony Brooks at the wheel, because that was the first British success for about 30 years in Grand Prix racing. So that is the car that put Britain on the map again in motor racing. Well, here's the scene at the very wet Wellington circuit. Few flashes of flame and lights, as, and off they go. And the Catane very slow away in the Connaught. He stalled on the line, raised his hand to make sure people behind know he's there. He doesn't mind losing the race. He doesn't want to lose the motor car. And leading looks like a Cooper Bristol. I could almost imagine someone like Jack Brabham driving that. You know, and that yellow-nosed car leading the field through a variety of race cars. <laughs> the Lister Jaguar stalled on the hairpin bend. We've got here a traffic jam that would do uh, do justice to a Friday night. Well, they all realise the value of cars, he's cranked it into life again, and now the one who's stuck at the back in car 50 is Tony Herbert Morton in a Janetta G4. So he has the shame, I suppose, of having to cop all the spray all the way around the track. The circuit 2.64 kilometres in length. It winds through the streets of, uh, of Wellington. And I don't know, if I owned a car as valuable as this, I don't think I'd be risking it on a wet day on a, on a track lined with arm go like this. But still, Roddy McPherson, a Scottish driver, one of three British drivers who've come here on a tour of, of New Zealand and Australia. Roddy taking his Cooper Bristol. I don't know about you, Colin, I suppose different memories belong to different people, but when I see one of these, I always think of Jack Brabham, who was virtually an unknown driver in Australia in those days, starting a car he painted red and called the Cooper Bristol, did so well in it that he eventually went to England and introduced himself to John Cooper and worked for him and drove for him, and of course the rest is history. This uh, particular car actually is uh, very similar to the one raced by the late Ken Wharton, who we'll remember was killed unfortunately at Ardmore. Now, it isn't the actual ex Wharton car, but it's in Wharton's colours, which is, is the gold nose, and it brings back nostalgic memories to all of the older people who were involved in motorsport at that stage. John Cooper was a pioneer British manufacturer, the first man really to introduce successfully the theme of having the engine in the back, certainly as far as post-war racing is concerned. The Cooper Bristol about his last of the front engine cars, and the Bristol engine was in fact a, firstly a BMW that had been uh, handed over to England along with the machinery for making it as part of the war reparations from the BMW factory, uh, a two litre engine and with the Bristol engine in the front and uh, Cooper building the chassis, it became one of the really famous cars of the era. Here we have another Cooper Bristol now, Rob Whitehouse in 33. In different colours, 
without the yellow nose, it looks a little bit more graceful in some ways, doesn't it? Hasn't it got quite the same yawning gap at the front. Yes, this is a grand motor car too, of course. This is the ex Horace uh, sorry, Horace Gould car, which was uh, raced in Britain extensively and then used in the NZ uh, Grand Prix in 1954. It actually came fourth. Although uh, Horace uh, said that he came first because everybody else made a mistake in counting the laps. Very famous car, it was in the Queenstown, Queenstown Motor Museum for a number of years, but it's grand to see it out again, particularly with Rob Whitehouse, who's very much of a, a proficient driver and a press on uh, chappy. Look at him now, he's uh, driving beautifully. And uh, a grand old motor car, lovely to see this. It's interesting to see these cars, which really do indicate the great changes that have occurred in motor racing. The, the narrow tyres are an obvious difference. Um, many people, I think, still think that narrow tyres look more graceful than the wide sort of tennis court rollers that uh, are fitted these days, the big wide slicks. The engine in the front, of course, you can see this too, just in the bonnet there for sucking in air for the carburetors. If you ever another very similar sort of car, Coming in third place, car number two, that's Wayne Mark from Dunedin in another Cooper Bristol, a Mark I model built back in 1952. Yes, it was the second built of the actual works cars that was raced from 1952 to 53 when it was converted to a sports car and used in sports racing. But uh, it's lovely to see it back in its original form again and uh, beautifully restored and very proficient in the tuner of uh, incredible uh, finesse when it comes to both motorcycles and uh, motor cars. Grand fellow driving very, very well. A picture to see this lovely little motor car. Well, he looks a little bit like a man in a bathtub with wheels on in terms of size, but uh, they were a very serious motor car and very different in concept to, to this one. And here is a car that really is a very famous car in this part of the world, isn't it? Well, this is the Lycoming uh, Special, which was built by Ralph Watson. And uh, Ralph, um, of course, is one of New Zealand's great uh, motor car builders because uh, this car uses a Lycoming aircraft engine. And he, Ralph turned the motor upside down and he dry sumped it and uh, built his own scavenger pump. And then he virtually built it in his own gearbox because the thing only uh, ran at about two and a half thousand revs a minute. And uh, Ralph made his own De Dion rear suspension for it. He uh, later sold it to Jim Boyd, who campaigned it all over uh, New Zealand. And um, the uh, great... Uh, oh, he's hit a fence. The little Mr Jaguar has gone into the fence. It's uh, Soames Langton, the British driver. I don't think any great damage was occurred then, but he almost got himself a, a bit more damage then when he came out, I think, in a, a, a slight fury of frustration from having buried the nose in the wall there. It doesn't appear to be any damage to the car, but there may have been a little bit of injury, though, to the man's pride. But the Mr. Jaguar would be a rather difficult car to handle around here, I would think, because it's a, it's a powerful machine, and as you can see, it has skinny tyres, and it's very wet out there, as you can well and truly see for yourself. And now we've got a pair of Mr. Jaguars out on the track. Car one following through, a very beautiful-looking blue example. That is a glorious motor car. If you had $100,000, would you be able to buy one of those? I think you'd be very lucky if you could, particularly that car, because it is glorious in every respect. And uh, Paul is one of the very lucky people in that he has a collection of cars here today, two of them, so he can decide which one he wants to drive. What a lucky person he must be. Well, that would be uh, many people's idea of paradise, I would think. So let's, uh, those of you who are watching, rejoice in a couple of things. One is that uh, you can watch these beautiful motor cars in action, and two, you don't have to be out there driving them in the wet. Well, he's having some trouble getting by the Lycoming special. That's a very famous car. It's the first time I've seen it in action, but of course I've heard about it for many years. Bruce McLaren drove it in a racing car event in the Lady Wigram Trophy, I think, and in fact got it cut up. I think he finished about fourth or fifth, but claimed he could have got at least second place had he not run out of brakes. Yes, this is true. We were there at this wonderful day, and I think Ralph Watson drove it in the sports car race, and to convert it from a sports car to a Grand Prix car, because Bruce didn't have a drive on that particular day, they took the mudguards off it and turned the headlights back to front, and Bruce jumped into it and uh, staggered everybody by fini finishing fourth behind uh, world-class Grand Prix motor cars. Reg Parnell, uh, in speaking of it afterwards, looked at the car and said that he simply couldn't believe that anything so beautiful and purposeful could have been built, built by a, uh, an engineer virtually in his garage shed. Uh, a great tribute to Ralph Watson and lovely to see this still racing today.
In case you're wondering how the race itself is going, rather than just rejoicing in the sight of the cars, the leader is car number three, and that's the uh, Roddy McPherson of Cuba Bristol Mark II, McPherson, the, uh, the Scottish driver. Then he then is leading car 33 in, in the second spot, and 33 is Rob Whitehouse in the other Cuba Bristol. We saw those cars earlier on, and in third place is car two, which is Wayne Marsh's Cuba Bristol Mark I. So it's very much a Cuba Bristol sort of benefit here. And number 13, that's a different sort of uh, of car. What is the ACE, uh, Colin? It's actually, it's a home-built car. It's got a Zephyr motor of 1956 vintage. It was uh, used regularly in the South Island in club events and whatnot. And a uh, very, very pretty car. Lovely to see this out again, uh, particularly doing so well. It was built by uh, uh, Wally Darrell, and uh, it was rebuilt... Uh, Many years later, and uh, as I say, it's great to see it's such a pretty little motor car uh, out on uh, the circuit today. Yeah, it's not what you'd imagine of a home-built car. I mean, it does have the, the professional look about it. You'd look at that and think, yes, it looks a bit like a, a van wall or maybe a Connaught or one of those sorts of cars that came from factories in the era, but that's a magnificently proportioned car. And he's running, where's car 13? He's running in seventh place in this race. There's about two and a half laps still to go in this class for uh, historic cars. By the way, just after this, we'll be having the the um, one-lap um, kamikaze sprint, if I could call it that, in which the 10 fastest cars in the big Group A touring car race, the Nissan Mobil 500, will be coming out in a series of one-lap dashes to see who qualifies for pole position and where the other nine will start in tomorrow's race. That's coming in a few moments. In the meantime, we're looking at these historic racing cars, cars back from the 50s and 60s and being driven with a great deal of dash by their present owners. Car 13, we're still following the ACE. And the cars are closing up as they're hustling for positions here. The Cooper Bristols are doing best. They're coming first, second and third at the moment. A very damp track here at Wellington this afternoon. A few of the sports cars coming through the field. Oh, a bit of a swing of a tail there. The leader of our race, car number three, with the yellow nose. Car three, from Scotland, Roddy McPherson in a Cooper Bristol Mark II, a 1953 model. It's got a 1971 engine, but 1971 only in CCs. It's 1,971 CCs inside. He's dressed to match his car, as you can see. He's driving very enthusiastically. You can see how hard he's going there. Directing, taking a very fine line there as he sits by the little blue sports car. That particular the... car, incidentally, has only had five owners in all its life, and it was used in Australia for a number of years by uh, uh, Ray Gibson, so it's quite well known over that side of the, uh, the test. The uh, car he's about to catch, by the way, if I could just interrupt, is Ken White in the Buckler 90, which is another interesting car. It's a, a British-made car, the Buckler, isn't it? But very rare. The only ones I've seen are out here in New Zealand. That particular one's interesting, and it still has the old Ford motor, the 1172 Ford motor, but it's got an overhead valve conversion, which gives it overhead inlet valves, but it uh, was restored uh, some years ago by the uh, Auckland Buckler expert, uh, Bruce Sutcliffe, and uh, once again, it's a beautifully presented car, and it's always driven well uh, by Ken White. Well, Buckler made two types of cars, one like this and one like an Austin 7, very different in shape but uh, made at Reading, just out of London, and good to see such a rare car in such fine condition and being driven with such a lot of verve. One lap to go, only one lap to go, car three still leading. Car 33 is in second spot. Three is a Cooper Bristol of Roddy McPherson. 33, as we uh, said earlier, is Rob Whitehouse from Auckland in the another Cooper Bristol. And in fourth spot is car number, in third spot rather, is car number 10. And number 10 is Ian Hallett in the Buckler MG, the one we were looking at. Plenty of spray on the road, and uh, McPherson still driving with a lot of dash. They're great characters, the fellows who drive these cars, aren't they, uh, Colin? They not only have the money to be able to acquire them and the enthusiasm to maintain them, but they also have uh, something in the way of, uh, of real daring, because these cars aren't easy, not by today's standards of driving. It's lovely to see the preparation that goes into these cars because uh, 
even though a lot of the people are not wealthy or anything like that, they spend so much uh, love on these uh, gorgeous little vehicles, which only a few years ago were really only uh, scrap. They were of uh, no great value. We could have bought some of these cars for probably two or three hundred dollars ten years ago, whereas um, today they're virtually priceless. They're on their last lap, and he's just uh, managed to uh, whip by one of the smaller cars. I dare say smaller car, because these are very different cars, ranging from what was an out-and-out leading contender in racing car events, such as this, and the chequered flag is out. And a win to one of our visitors, Roddy McPherson from Scotland in the Cooper Bristol Mark II. A good win. He's not slowing down or showing any signs of diminishing. He must be enjoying himself, I think. And second spot, we'll see car 33, another Cooper Bristol, but a local one, Rob Whitehouse from Auckland. He'll take the flag for second spot. In third place will be car number 10. 10 is Ian Hallett from Auckland in a buckler. And then uh, car 17. 17 is Colin Waite, also from uh, Auckland, in a uh, Stangrelini, a Formula Junior car, which is sort of wheeled his way up through the field as the, uh, the whole contingent now comes by. A reminder, though, that we are about to have the, the uh, qualifying session here in which the top 10 contenders so far in the Group A race, the fastest 10 from the, the earlier practice session when the track was dry, will come out and whoever makes fastest time will get pole for tomorrow and the other will take their order in the starting line according to how they perform in this next and therefore critical practice session. But it's been a, a great race for the historic cars. Thanks to you, Colin McGregor, for joining us. Colin, the president of the Thoroughbred and Classic Car Club. And uh, let's hope that people who have been at home and seen some of these car races and, and maybe know where uh, an old chassis or an old motor or the bits and pieces of some old car that deserves restoration will have seen this and possibly been inspired to uh, get out and spend a year or two in the garage and put them back together. And maybe we'll see them here in a couple of years' time at a future meeting here at the Wellington Waterfront Circuit. So having gone round and won extra lap with a little buckler just taking a line there, it's the other buckler which looks very different from the little tight little sports car we saw before, which indicates a variety of some of the cars competing here. A reminder again, the, the winner was the Scottish driver, uh, Roddy McPherson in the Cooper Bristol Mark II. That's the way they finished in the eight lap invitation historic race here at Wellington. But don't forget, the touring cars out in a few minutes with all the action, the spray, the horsepower, as they go for starting positions in tomorrow's Nissan Mobile 500.